Thanks, guys. That was really sweet. Uh, I really appreciate it. And, and uh, I'll see you guys Tuesday, I guess. Uh, oh, and tell Chamberlain he can come this time. All right? Okay, cool. Thanks. <sighs> September 28th, 1940. The Pact of Steel made last year between Germany and Italy created the Berlin-Rome Axis. This week, Japan adds Tokyo to that axis, and the Axis powers are official. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Italian invasion of Egypt came to a halt, and Adolf Hitler postponed his plans for an invasion of Britain. But the Japanese invasion of China, now over three years old, continued. At the moment, they are fighting the Chinese Communist Army in the Battle of the Hundred Regiments. The Japanese are sending reinforcements from their city garrisons. From Taiwan, they send men on the Tongpu Railway Line and eastward along the Zhengtai Line. Others come westward along the Zhengtai from Shijiazhuang and head straight for the base areas where the Communist 8th Route Army is. That army is still feeling pretty good about its successes in phase one of the offensive, so they often meet the Japanese head on. The bloodiest fighting of the entire campaign took place during phase two, with heavy casualties on both sides. The outcome was a foregone conclusion. Despite the unquestioned bravery of its troops, CCP forces could not sustain this sort of combat against reinforced Japanese forces vastly superior in weaponry, if not numbers. The Japanese are doing a lot this week. On the 22nd, they occupy French Indochina and station 6,000 troops there to prevent aid from reaching China from French Indochina. The French must agree to all their demands. They don't really have much choice. On the 25th, the Japanese 5th Division enters Hanoi. That same day, though, the U.S. announces a new loan to China. They will continue to support Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese Nationalist Army. On the 26th, the United States places an embargo on all scrap iron and steel to Japan. And on September 27th, the Tripartite Pact is signed. Germany, Italy, and Japan promise that each will declare war on those who join the war against any of the other three. They state that this does not affect any relations with the USSR. The big hope is that this will deter the US from getting involved in the war in Europe or becoming more active in the Far East. In fact, the pact promises that they will aid each other should one of them be attacked by a power not involved in the European war. This is clearly directed at the United States. And it is true that the U.S. seems ever more led to the Allied cause. This week in the U.S., the cover photo of Life magazine is of three-year-old Eileen Dunn, a victim of Luftwaffe bombs, and there is a whole photo spread of bomb damage in Britain in the magazine. But the message now sent home from Americans in London is that Britain is going to survive, and American public opinion about the war is slowly changing. The interventionists are gaining ground. Also, something I didn't mention last week was the formation of the first Eagle Squadron on the 19th. These will eventually be three squadrons of the Royal Air Force formed with volunteers from the United States. And the first is number 71 Squadron, which is interesting because the unit known by that name in Britain in World War I was the Australian Flying Corps 4th Squadron, called 71st to distinguish it from the Royal Flying Corps 4th Squadron. The Australians never called it the 71st, though. The requirements for joining the new 71st are a high school diploma, 2020 vision, or vision correctable to 2020, and 300 hours of certified flying time. American pilots with Eagle Squadrons do not renounce their American citizenship, though they do have the ranks and uniforms of the RAF, those uniforms being modified with the Eagle Squadron patch. It will be several months before the first squadron will be operational, though. The rest of the RAF is certainly operational right now, though. And the night of the 24th comes a bombing raid on Berlin, the second night in a row. German propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels' press is not happy about this. I read in James Holland's The Battle of Britain that the Nachtausgabe read, New Night Act of the Pirates, and Borsen Zeitung reported, Last night, Churchill continued his series of criminal blows against the German civilian population. Frankly, Churchill belongs to that category of criminals who in their stupid brutality are unteachable. Actually, speaking of Goebbels, also on the 24th is the first public showing of the film Jud Sus. 
Goebbels had a big hand in getting it put together and produced. This is one of the most anti-Semitic films ever produced. And it will be a huge hit, with more than 20 million people seeing it in Germany alone. That's nearly a third of the population, even though it's banned for children under 14. There will be special screenings for the Hitler Youth, and apparently Heinrich Himmler orders all police and SS men to see the film. The film premiered two weeks ago at the Venice Film Festival and got excellent reviews and is in fact shown all over occupied Europe. It will be the number one film of the year in the Reich. Also this week on the German home front, Himmler, as head of the SS, signs the decree that all gold teeth, fillings, and bridge work should be taken out of the mouths of camp inmates. SS Lieutenant Colonel Hermann Puck is put in charge of Operation Tooth. On arrival at a concentration camp, inmates were examined for dental gold. If any was found, a small tattoo was made on the upper left arm for quick and easy identification in due course in the camp morgue. At the same time, a form was filled in, giving the location of the tooth and its estimated yield in gold. The Germans, though, are not just being bombed, but are themselves bombing the British as the Battle of Britain continues. On the 26th, a raid on a Spitfire factory stops production for a while, but the overall picture is summed up by German flying ace Adolf Galland, the 27th. At Luftwaffe chief Hermann Goering's hunting lodge, where Galland had been asked to come and bag a stag as a reward for his 40th aerial victory, he said, British plane wastage was far lower and production far higher than the German intelligence staff estimated. And now, events were exposing the error so plainly that it had to be acknowledged. The German people are really wondering why the invasion of Britain has not taken place. The euphoria of the spring and summer victories has worn off by now, and they're beginning to realize the war might not be over so soon. The British are, of course, still worried about invasion. Photographs very, very clearly show the masses of invasion barges at Antwerp and the French Channel ports. This is also the period of the Battle of the Big Wing controversy. Big wing flying formations, also known as Balbos, after Italo Balbo, Italian fascist and builder of the Italian Air Force, who served as marshal of that Air Force this year until his death, which we saw a few months ago, are advocated by British wing commander Douglas Bader. That was a long sentence, you'll figure it out. He thinks fighters should attack the enemy in large formations to hit them with maximum attack power. His commander in 12 group is Air Vice Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory. And he supports this, but Air Vice Marshal Keith Park, who commands 11 Group, that responsible for the fighter defense of London and Southeast England, does not. Park says, concentrating the fighters like that would allow waves of German bombers to come in while British fighters were rearming on the ground. Richard Overy writes in his The Battle of Britain that these differing opinions are really the results of geography. Park's pilots are usually facing waves of bombers with strong fighter escorts. Lee Mallory's pilots meet the bombers much further inland when their fighter defenses are weaker and importantly, when their positions are already known. Bader's big wing goes up five times in September, but it isn't an organized unit, just a roughly assembled collection of squadrons. And there's been no planning on how to use it or how to assess its effectivity. Park will not use big wings over London, and there is now a lot of tension between him and Lee Mallory. I imagine we'll see more on the big wing controversy and that tension in a few weeks. But if the British are playing defense at home, elsewhere, they go on the attack. From the 23rd to the 25th, together with the Free French, they try to win Dakar. Dakar is one of the major French colonial capitals and is under Vichy French control. You might not realize it, but this, Operation Menace, is Britain and France's first real offensive of the war. Charles de Gaulle and Admiral Andrew Cunningham are the leaders of 3,600 Free French and 4,300 British. Admiral Landriau commands the Vichy naval forces and Governor Boisson is in overall charge. A Free French attempt to land is repulsed and the garrison soon opens fire on the British ships with the 15-inch guns of the battleship Richelieu never used in combat before. Two British ships take damage, and after two days of trading fire, the operation is called off, as the attackers realize that winning would mean inflicting large civilian casualties. 
The French attackers are surprised, actually, that the Vichy French do not simply transfer their loyalty to de Gaulle upon arrival, and are even more surprised that British ships are fired upon. 24th and 25th, the Vichy French Air Force bombs Gibraltar in response. And there is news this week from the far north of Europe. On the 25th, Reichskommissar Josef Terboven formally deposes Norway's King Haakon and appoints Vidkun Quisling to lead the new government. Quisling, you may remember from the spring, was the leader of Norway's fascist party, National Samling, and had tried and failed to set up a government just after the German invasion. Terboven, who's been running the show since then, does not like Quisling and has not wanted any place in the government for either him or for his party. In fact, back in June, Terboven had forced Quisling to step down as party leader and go to Germany. However, in August, Quisling had won Hitler over to his side and return. Terboven has to go on the radio and announce the end of the monarchy and the dissolution of all political parties except National Samling. Parliament won't be dissolved and Terboven will keep power. Quisling will be acting prime minister and will have a sort of cabinet of National Samling members. The term Quisling as a traitor or collaborator was first used in print back on April 15th, just a week after the invasion, in the header for an article in the Times, Quislings everywhere. And another week of war comes to an end, with active fighting in Africa, China, and Britain, and the formalizing of the Axis powers. Which is a big deal. Of course, the fighting in the East and West has been related and has had connections before, but this is now formalized into an active world war on three continents. Japan has now invaded French territory. Heck, the French have just tried to invade French territory. Just different French. And the Axis eyes are on the US. And the German eyes are on the USSR. And it really looks like this bloody and brutal war may well kick into overdrive gear one of these days. An enormous and catastrophic overdrive. If you'd like to see the origins of the propaganda films which helped spread Nazi ideology, check out our Between Two Wars episode about the rise of movies and the movie stars right here in just a minute. Speaking of stars, today is in fact my 52nd birthday. If you want to give me something for my birthday, then please make it your support at patreon.com or timegoes.tv. That support is what finances this show, and yes, every single dollar makes a difference. Subscribe, click the bell, See you next time.